two years ago, I died. It was nothing special. A car accident. People die all the time in car crashes. I was on my way home from work, pulling out onto the motorway, and a truck was going too fast. I know exactly what happened, because my lawyer showed me the truck's dashcam footage. My car spun out, then flipped over. The roof buckled and hit my head. Both my lungs were punctured, my legs were broken, half my ribs were cracked. I was unconscious, barely alive, when the paramedics arrived. I was in the operating theater for 16 hours, and in that time I died for 95 seconds. Miraculously, the surgeons saved my life. I was in a coma for eight months. They thought I'd never wake up. But somehow I did. First they said I'd never survive. Then they said I'd never wake up. Then they said I had irreparable brain damage. Then they said I'd never walk again. Time after time, I beat the odds. The brain is a funny thing. I should know I'm a neuroscientist. I'm not a doctor or a brain surgeon. I do research, fMRI scans, that sort of thing. That evening I'd been driving home from a day of interviewing people with synesthesia. That's where your senses mix with each other you can smell sounds or taste colors. We were testing the hypothesis that people who claim to see auras are actually synesthetes they see a person's mood through their facial expressions and body language and their brain interprets that by overlaying colors around them. I don't know if it's true, there's a long way to go before we're ready to publish. This is to say that when I eventually persuaded the hospital to discharge me, still with a walking cane and occasional dizzy spells, I had a pretty good idea of what to expect. That still didn't prepare me for the actual experience. I'd got used to the white walls and the beeping machines of a few hospital rooms. The taxi journey home was overwhelming, made worse by arriving back to an empty house with no food and hardly any furniture. You know the bit in the wedding vows about. Till death do us part. Turns out my wife had figured that 95 seconds of death still counted. She'd moved on to another guy during my eight-month vacation. I'm sure she was delighted that I was finally able to consent to selling our house. With my savings, sick pay, state benefits, and my share from the sale, I was at least able to rent a small flat. I even found a nurse, Anita, who specialized in both physiotherapy and mental health, and visited three times a week to check up on me, helping me with the basics while I got back on my feet. Early on I was sleeping 18 hours a day, and was overwhelmed if I spent more than a few minutes outside. Thank goodness for Deliveroo. Over several months I gradually recovered. I was able to walk around my apartment without holding onto the walls, and even went out shopping with Anita and then later without her. Eventually I convinced her to take me back into work, just for a day. I was still employed there and hoped to go back part-time soon. Now the thing with being a neuroscientist is you have easy access to brain scanners. We'd all scanned our brains a few times, and I even have a picture of my brain scan above my work desk at home. My ex-wife was at least kind enough to pack my things neatly. So one of the first things I did after checking that they hadn't ditched my coffee mug was get a new scan. Do you know what the amygdala is? It's a pair of tiny nuggets of brain tissue each about the shape and size of an almond. It's really important in regulating emotions, among many other things. Your brain takes in a huge amount of data, far too much to process, and your amygdala acts as a sort of pattern-matching algorithm and filter. To massively oversimplify my two decades of experience, there are three things the amygdala does when it receives data. If it perceives threatening or overwhelming stimuli, it sends you into fight-slash-flight-slash-freeze mode. Your limbic system takes over, and you act emotionally rather than rationally. If it detects a familiar pattern of stimuli, it invokes the part of your brain that knows how to deal with the situation at hand. This basically sends you into autopilot, and it's why you can drive to work with no real memory of the journey. And if it detects an unfamiliar, but non-threatening, event, it rallies your frontal lobe. This is the rational, thinking, brain 
and it's how we're able to learn new skills like calculus or the piano. The amygdala does a lot of filtering before actually passing along the data it decides is relevant. I've viewed images of healthy brains countless times. I've also studied plenty of brains with damage to the amygdala. I've never before seen an amygdala that looked like mine, post-crash. It certainly explained why I was still having headaches and dizzy spells. To be honest, I was worse than the doctors realized, but being a neuroscientist, I knew what lies to tell them to keep them off my back. Truth is I could barely even focus, visually or mentally, for more than about half an hour. And now I knew why. As best I could tell, the pattern matching role of my amygdala was functioning perfectly. The filter wasn't. The effects of this were reduced somewhat due to very high doses of psychostimulants to keep my frontal cortex active, and antipsychotics to help me moderate my emotions and reduce mental agitation. Essentially this combination of medications seemed at least partially effective in moderating my brain function in the ways my amygdala was no longer capable of doing. But these are powerful drugs, and long-term use could cause even more brain damage, so I was coming off them. Slowly, but faster than my doctors would have let me if I'd been honest about my symptoms. I can tell you when it started, or at least when I first noticed it. My drugs were down to 50%, and Anita only came round once a week, so it was a Thursday. She rang the bell as normal, I opened the door as normal, she walked in as normal, with a maggot on her right cheek. You, uh, you've got something on your cheek, I said watching the three centimeters gray larva wriggle slightly. Oh, Anita said, almost disinterested, and wiped her face. All she managed to do was move it slightly to the side. And then most disturbingly she checked in the mirror in my hall, looked satisfied, and proceeded to carry out her usual checks on me. Let me tell you, that was an uncomfortable exam. The whole time I was staring at the thing, waiting for it to inevitably fall onto me. She just acted as though it wasn't even there. Half an hour later she'd finished her tests. I was coming along nicely, she told me, although my eyes were a little dilated. I didn't tell her that hers would be too, if she'd spent thirty minutes watching a maggot crawl on somebody's face. I could have shrugged that off. Especially as nothing happened for the rest of the day, and I mean nothing. Ten hours awake followed by half an hour of focused social interaction even though I was recovering, that took it out of me, and I went to bed, as I usually did after her visits. On Friday morning I decided I wanted a change from my usual food. A local shop was just ten minutes walk away, so I headed out. I wanted cereal and fruit. As I entered the shop I braced myself for the loud bell that rang when you opened the door something that used to annoy me even before I fucked my amygdala. I didn't brace for the smell. Something putrid assailed my nostrils the moment the door opened. I gagged, spent a moment composing myself, and walked to the cereal shelves. That was fine. I grabbed a box of Frosties. Then I headed to the fruit section, and found the source of the smell. The fruit was rotten. Gray and green mold covered every fruit in there. The bananas were black and mushy, at least I think they were mushy. I didn't dare touch them. Helen, I called to the woman on the counter. Helen, what's up with the fruit? Helen looked over at me. What do you mean? It's rotten. Helen walked out to me and inspected the shelves. She picked up a few blobs from behind a handwritten sign that insisted they were apples. Turning them over in her hands one by one, she eventually picked out two that looked no better or worse than the rest. Yeah, I'll chuck these. Bring whatever you want to the counter. I'll check them for you. I only bought the cereal. I stayed in for the next few days. I could focus enough to read neuroscience papers for a couple of hours a day, broken up into short stints. Meanwhile, I made a valiant attempt to catch up on my Netflix backlog, which had been bad even before my time out from life. Nothing with subtitles though, I couldn't quite cope with those yet. As Thursday approached, I found myself getting worried. Last week had been pretty awful, and I dreaded a repeat. 
Anita rang the bell just after noon and I opened the door to her. There were no maggots. I mean, you've got to try to find the positives in life, right? Anita's clothes, usually the light blue NHS uniform, were dark and ragged. She looked like she had been dragged through a bush. But that wasn't the worst of it. She had, well it's hard to say. It was like an outline. A sort of fuzzy black shadow surrounding her. Like I said before, I've done work on the purported phenomenon of auras, and I'd read and heard plenty of first-hand reports. This shadow looked sort of like those, but I've never heard others talk of the dread I felt emanating from this nurse. I started to tell Anita I wasn't feeling well. She walked in anyway. This will only take a few minutes. And if you're not feeling well, it's all the more important I do a proper checkup. I really wish I could say that half hour was the most stressful time of my life. Anita didn't do anything unusual. She took my biometrics, just as before, and left. All that time though, I was watching the shadows shift and pulsate around her. This was enough time for me to make some good scientific observations. The pulsations were roughly in time with a heartbeat, but not mine, which was racing. I can only assume they were in time with hers. I watched as parts of it flipped out into little tendrils, flailing in the air. They felt cold when they touched me. After she left, still cheerful as always, I retreated to my bedroom. I put on some Netflix junk, but I wasn't really watching it. I have always had a scientific mind, and in the worrying I did, a plan started to form. I didn't leave the house for days. I read all I could about auras, the scientific papers, the spiritual stuff I've always assumed was bunk everything. I read about the side effects of my medication, and the reported effects of the specific combination, very little. And I came up with an idea. What if my specific biology, my specific injuries, and these specific medications had an unusual effect? So I came off the medication. I was already on half doses. I spent two days on a quarter, two days on an eighth, and then nothing. I didn't check with the doctors, as I already knew what they'd say. This did my headaches no good, but ordinary paracetamol helped. A couple of weeks later, after suffering through two more visits from Anita, I left the house. This was last Wednesday. It was early afternoon, fairly quiet with nobody around. I could see the familiar houses, a few trees, street furniture, the usual things you see on any residential street. But they were far from ordinary. The trees were rotten. The few leaves that remained were wilted and covered in fungus. Trunks and branches were split open, horrible mushroom-like things sprouting from their insides. I couldn't tell if the trees were dead, but they were far from healthy. Road signs were faded and rusting, and the road itself was degraded, covered in cracks and potholes filled with some sort of liquid. Like mud, but it looked slimy. I definitely didn't want to test this by touching it. The houses were decrepit. Many looked like they were about to fall down, and one with a, to let, sign outside it actually had its roof caved in. One house was freshly painted, and the incongruity between the almost collapsed structure of the house and the clean paint made my head hurt. But even then, the paint was already starting to peel. If it wasn't for the fresh paint, the scene in front of me could have easily been mistaken for an abandoned street in a post-apocalyptic movie. A thought occurred to me. I went back inside, got my phone, and took a photo of the street. Looking at the photo on the screen of my phone, everything looked normal. I stood there for a long time, comparing what the phone saw and what my eyes saw. One of them was lying to me but which one? I turned around, headed back into my house which I now saw had crumbling walls and moss growing out of a multitude of spiderweb-like cracks and pondered the question. Our brains are extremely powerful, capable of processing far more information than a phone camera. I believe our eyes see the world as it is, and our brain filters the input to present us with the accepted version of the world. I can no longer do that. The very particular brain damage I sustained would normally have killed a human. I could very well be the first person to suffer this specific damage, 
and be unlucky enough to survive with the rest of my mental faculties intact. Perhaps there were a few others like me, consigned to psychiatric institutions somewhere. I determined right there and then that I would not let myself suffer such incarceration. I'm a scientist. I experiment, observe, collect data. So that's exactly what I did. That afternoon I took my phone, a notebook and clipboard, and walked into town. Without the drugs helping with the filtering my amygdala used to do, I could see the real world more clearly than two weeks earlier. I passed a few people on the way to the shopping center. They were all surrounded by those shadowy auras, and now I could make out more definition. The auras were roughly human-shaped, covering them all over like a spacesuit, but the shape fluctuated. From the other side of the street, I didn't want to get too close, I could make out dark translucent tendrils coming off of the auras. But the more I looked, the more I realized they were, mostly, not coming out of the people, but going into them. When I reached the shopping center I sat down on a rarely used bench, close enough to observe people yet far enough away that few would pass near me. At lunch people would sit on it to eat their sandwiches, but it was now nearly four o'clock. I made a mental note to leave before five, to avoid the crowds. I took a few photos, but they all came out, normal. My camera wasn't going to help, so instead I sketched people. I took an evening class on sketching a few years back, so I was adequately skilled. After five or six sketches I looked back at the pictures, trying to discern any patterns. The tendrils were worming their way into people's bodies all over, but they were much more focused on the heart and the head. The source of blood and the source of our thinking. This was early April, and I'd been surprised by the number of flies buzzing around the people I sketched but hadn't really taken much notice of them. Right then I didn't think they were significant. I moved on to drawing the dilapidated buildings, the location of moss and mold on the road, and the abysmal state of the cars that passed by. Around half four I got up and walked home. The shopping center is due west of my house, so I'd had the sun in my eyes for the walk there. It was therefore something of a surprise to see the sun on my walk back. Actually, it wasn't the sun. Not the sun I'm used to anyway. About half the size and red. I turned back. Our usual yellow sun was in its proper place. If I'd seen this in the past, I'd have been shocked and bewildered. That day, it was just another bit of weirdness. Had it always been there, and I'd just never seen it before? I sketched the two suns and managed to make it the rest of the way home without any further strange things happening to me. The inside of my flat was a welcome change from the weird, rotting world outside. It's only a bedroom, living room, kitchen and bathroom, and I'd kept up with the cleaning of one person's mess easily during the last few months. Even so, I could now see the mold and damp patches on the walls, the rotting wood of the furniture, and strange cracks along the plaster. The kitchen stank, so I threw away the copious amounts of moldy food and ordered home delivery of a load of canned and ultra-processed food. As well as lots of bottled water, the tap water was brackish and tinted brown. Anita arrived right on schedule the next day. I don't know if the shadowy aura was stronger, or if I was just seeing it more clearly now. I counted three maggots, one on her face and two on her hair. Flies buzzed around her, and as she poked and prodded I kept my eyes closed, grateful only for the fact that she wore sterile gloves for the examination. After twenty minutes trying not to gag due to the stench, she told me I seemed physically fine but emotionally agitated. No shit! I thought to myself. Anita arranged an inpatient appointment for the next week. I agreed just to get her to finish and leave, with no intention of actually going. TV is good. Whatever things look like in reality apparently doesn't show up on camera. I spent the rest of the day binge-watching Netflix and YouTube, just to experience some semblance of normality. The next day I made an appointment with the doctor. If I'd been taking my meds as prescribed I would have been out that day, and it's amazing how quickly you can get an appointment when you claim your antipsychotics have run out.
I drove to the GP surgery in the light of two sons, stayed in my car until the very last moment, and then went in. My doctor was running on time, hooray! And I was ushered into his office by a receptionist with skin barely clinging onto their face. I sat down opposite a short white balding man in a white coat. Or at least, I think it was supposed to be white. The stains made it difficult to be sure. I wondered if it had been months since he had washed it, or if it had picked up all that filth in just a day or two. The doctor asked me the usual questions, and I answered them. But a refill of my medication wasn't the reason I was there. I wanted to study another person up close, and no longer felt like I trusted Anita. Also I felt safer outside of my home, somewhere I could flee from if necessary. He had the usual aura I'd come to expect, and I watched as the tendrils snaked about him, occasionally burrowing into his skin as though it wasn't there. The skin was blemished and scarred in ways I hadn't seen before, and his face bled from two open sores. Several flies buzzed around him, dipping into and out of the aura and dragging it around with them. After satisfying himself with the answers to my questions, the doctor had to do a bit of work on the computer. I noticed that the flies were unusual, and took this opportunity to get my notebook out and sketch one of them. They were big. Far bigger than any flies I've seen before, at four or five centimeters across. And the more I looked, the more they didn't quite look like flies. I studied them, and completed a quick rough sketch that I could improve on later. They had black bodies with green stripes, and four wings, so they weren't true flies. Some other sort of insect? I'm not much of an entomologist, but I know that insects all have six legs. These had four legs, and rather than compound eyes, they seemed to have two orb-like eyes on the end of stalks. This wasn't a combination I knew from any species. I was becoming more and more unnerved, and then I realized they do in fact have six limbs four legs, and two grasping limbs at the front. These things are capable of holding small objects. But what really threw me what led me to running out of the doctor's office without a prescription was what happened next. Two of the flies landed on my notebook. They seemed to study the sketch I had made. Then they started buzzing. Or to be more precise, they'd been buzzing all along. Now, they buzzed in what, to me, sounded a lot like communication. Insect buzzing comes from the wings flapping in flight, but I heard it even from the two that weren't flying. Then they rose up, joining the other flies. Ten or eleven of them I think, hovering half a meter from my face, and all looking at me and buzzing to each other. They'd been content to ignore me until then. But now they knew that I could see them. I ran, without a word to my doctor. I got to my car and drove as fast as I could back home not looking back to see if they were following. I reached my flat, raced inside, and started covering any hole they could possibly get through. Clothes against the doorframe, duct tape across the air vents, anything I could to seal myself in. Now when a person runs out of their doctor's surgery in terror, it's normal to do some follow-up. When they're not taking their antipsychotic medication, it turns out the follow-up is with the police. Two hours later the cops turned up at my door, asking if I was okay. I hadn't done anything illegal, except possibly speeding on the way home, so I spoke to them through the glass of the window of my living room. I convinced them that I wasn't in immediate danger to myself or others, and eventually they left to make their report. Their flies did not. A dozen or so flies, buzzing against my window. They dragged the shadow aura with them tracing thick lines of it through the air as they flew. I saw some of them disappear, and assumed at first that they were trying to find another way in. No such luck. Shortly after they left, a hundred more turned up. And this, I fear, is where my story ends. My food and water delivery should last me a week, maybe two. I live almost entirely in my bedroom now, venturing out only to use the toilet, and to secure the gaps where the flies have been trying to tunnel in. Between the flies and their shadow trails, I can barely see anything outside, apart from the yellow light filtering through in the daytime and the red light of the evening sun. I can barely sleep, partly because I live in constant fear, 
and partly because the buzzing of thousands tens of thousands of flies is overwhelming. So with nothing else to do, I'm posting my account to the internet. As if that will do any good. The best I can hope for now is that I run out of food and starve to death. I don't want to know what happens to me if they get in while I'm still alive. Subscribe and make sure to hit the bell icon to turn on notifications. Put the playlist on in the background to finish listening to all the stories. Linked at the top of the description. Either way, thanks a lot for watching and we'll see you guys next time.